All right, guys. Uh, my name is Ryan Nerney, and I'm a managing partner at the nationally recognized security clearance, military, and federal employment law firm, Tully Rinke. Uh, welcome to the second episode of the podcast of the National Security Clearance Lawyers Association. Uh, this is the one and only podcast made to teach people from all industries that require security clearance. The ins and outs of the security clearance process, what the adjudicative bodies look for in potential disqualifying and mitigating conditions, and what potential and common situations mean for your security clearance. Uh, so whether you're an employee for a government contractor, a federal employee, or a member of the military, uh, you're sure to hopefully pick up some tidbits of useful information when you listen to the NSLA podcast. Uh, today, for our second episode, I'm joined by Anthony Kuhn, uh, the managing partner of Tony Rinke's Buffalo office, and the chair of the NSLA. Uh, so, Tony, tell us a little bit about yourself. All right. So, thanks, Ryan, for the invite. Um, excited to be here today. Uh, I am, as you said, the chair of our firm's military and national security practice groups, uh, managing partner of the Buffalo, New York office, and a uh, 26-year veteran of the Army and Army Reserve. Awesome. Uh, so thanks for being here, Tony. Um, so in today's episode, guys, we're going to talk about the general differences between security clearance and suitability determinations uh, and what the adjudicative standards are for each, uh, and maybe a little bit more information about uh, both aspects of those processes because they are a little bit different. Um, so hopefully by the end of this episode, uh, you will have a general understanding as to the differences between the suitability determination uh, and security clearance uh, processes uh, to hopefully, hopefully help you through your employment journey. Uh, so let's jump into it. So, uh, Tony, c- give me a little bit of information as far as uh, what, what actually is a security clearance. All right. So, Ryan, uh, as you know, a security clearance or an investigation into a security clearance is uh, an inquiry into a person's loyalty, character, trustworthiness, and reliability uh, the goal there is to ensure whether that individual should be eligible to access national security information. Uh, and as you know, the standard is whether it's clearly consistent with national interests to grant that individual access to classified information. Awesome. And then, obviously, uh, to, uh, to the contrary, uh, you know, suitability determination, although they can be related, um, essentially that is an investigation uh, or an inquiry into a person's uh, character traits and conduct uh, sufficient to decide whether that person should be employed by the federal government um, and would or would not protect the integrity or promote the efficiency of the service uh, of, of that agency. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's there's kind of an overlap uh, per se, but uh, typically a, a suitability determination is, is done prior to any type of security clearance investigation, right? Yeah, we get this question a lot. A lot of people confuse the two because they're similar forms. Uh, but, you know, an individual who is seeking suitability is really just trying to get through an employment decision. So it's not always a sensitive position. You know, it's, it's usually a federal government employee, and the agency is trying to determine whether or not they want to employ that individual. So if they think that a person is suitable or fit for the position, then they would go ahead, move forward with the security clearance application, and what we call release the SF-86 for adjudication. So it's entirely possible that um, a person gets denied suitability and they think that they're actually fighting a security clearance adjudication and they haven't even moved on to that step in the process yet. Yeah, and sometimes that could be a little convoluted as well because agencies sometimes word those denial letters poorly, right? right? So right. it makes it a little bit more difficult for, for people who are not well-versed in this area of law to, to kind of understand that. Yeah, I mean, it's not uncommon for the employees of those agencies to not understand it themselves. So then it it leads to the, you know, the incoming employees' confusion. Absolutely. So is there – so you mentioned the SF-86, and I know we kind of went over this a little bit in in the last episode, if you listened to it. But, um, you know, is – could you fill out an SF-86 or even an SF-85 or an SF-85P prior to any type of uh, suitability determination? Yeah, I mean, in fact, a lot of the – this is a question we get a lot as well. A lot of the agencies will look at the information on those applications and, and use some of that information to make their decision about whether an individual is employable or not, in other words, whether they're suitable or not. So if, for example, you admit on an SF-86 to recent and frequent drug use, that agency might then uh, send you a, a declination or a withdrawal letter from your conditional offer telling you that they're no longer interested in employing you. Uh, that's a suitability 
determination or a fitness determination, a lot of times we'll give you 30 days to draft a written response, but it doesn't usually come with the same levels of protection or due process that an actual security clearance adjudication would. So they kind of can use it as a backdoor, I guess, to kind of withdraw a job offer if they kind of look at everything and say, hey, this guy's going to be, or, or this this uh, person is going to be uh, an issue either to become suitable for employment or to eventually get a security clearance down the line. Sure. I mean, how many cases have you seen where an individual uh, is is removed based on information that's on their SF-86 and you have to wonder, is this just to save the time and the headache of going through the security clearance adjudication process because it might not cost the company any money, but they might have the position tied up for a long time. They've got somebody that they've already uh, extended a conditional offer to. Are they going to sit and wait for a year for that to play out if they have to go to a hearing and go through all the steps? Uh, if they if they weed them out early through a suitability determination, they might not ever release the SF-86, and then they don't have to worry about any of the due process protections that come in the adjudication process for the actual clearance. So I, I think you're right. I think they use it as a tool to weed people out early. Absolutely. I, I see it quite a bit, actually. Uh, more often than you would think. Um, you know, that's just kind of a strategy, I guess, that the government uses to, uh, you know, save some time and money. Um, all right. So uh, as far as the regulations that govern each one of these, so, you know, typically security clearances are governed by uh, the seed for um, you know, which again was discussed in the last episode, um, you know, which lays out the adjudicative guidelines for security clearances. Suitability determinations are typically governed by OPM regulations, uh, specifically 5 CFR 731. Um, so in your view, Tony, what, um, I guess what are the general uh, adjudicative guidelines for security clearances um, that, that adjudicators kind of look at to, to make those determinations. And then we've got to get to the suitability after that. Okay. Yeah, so um, as, you, as you you kind of hinted at it earlier, but a lot of times we'll use them interchangeably. I think some of the people even um, processing applications, security officers and others, might get confused about uh, which regulation actually governs what they're doing at the time. So occasionally we get a suitability determination that has adjudicative guideline language in it. Uh, and you know, there are a lot of overlaps, as you mentioned earlier. Uh, it's really the same concerns that uh, apply in both, but and, which is why we use the mitigation to mitigate uh, suitability determinations. We'll use the mitigation from the adjudicative guidelines in most cases. But uh, as you know, there's 13 adjudicative guidelines, and, uh, you know, those are pretty easy to search out, but they go A, B, C, and down the line, starting with allegiance to the United States, and then there's foreign contacts, there's drug involvement, criminal conduct, um, uh, financial considerations is a very common uh, reason for individuals to have to litigate to keep their clearance, uh, sexual behavior, misuse of information technology systems, uh, alcohol and, and uh, drug use, things of that nature. So uh, we've seen, you know, cases that, that, that span uh, all of the 13 guidelines. And, you know, usually there's one or two guidelines that apply in a case, but Rarely we'll get the, the case with four or five guidelines alleged all in one case. And what we have to do is we have to go through those guidelines and try to mitigate each of those individual concerns uh, and, and show to the to the uh, the judge or the reviewer that it is clearly consistent with national interest for an individual to, to have their security clearance and, and gain access to uh, national security information. Yeah, you made some good points there uh, as well. You know, one of the things you mentioned was, uh, you know, kind of the overlap between, uh, you know, the adjudicative guidelines for security clearances and, you know, suitability determinations. You know, I've actually seen on a few occasions where, uh, you know, the agency issues a letter and they say, yes, this is only a fitness determination. It's not a security clearance determination. And then on the back end, the attachment basically has the adjudicative guidelines for security clearances as the uh, uh as, as the means of, of what they're using to adjudicate the, the suitability. So um, it, it's, it's very funny how they kind of do that, um, you know. And But, again, like you said before, they're kind of interchangeable. You know, like I mentioned, the, uh, the 5 CFR 731, you know, lays out the OPM and agency's uh, guidance as far as what they, uh, they should consider um, for suitability cases. Um, it includes the nature of the position for which the person is applying, um, or which they're employed, the nature and seriousness of the conduct, circumstances surrounding that conduct, recency of the conduct, the age of the person involved at the time of the conduct, uh, contributing societal conditions, um, and the absence or presence of rehabilitation. 
Um, you know, all those things uh, can be tied into a, uh, you know, security clearance uh, determination. And like you mentioned before, Tony, you can use that mitigation uh, from the security clearance adjudicative guidelines and kind of, um, you know, attribute those to the suitability discussions as well. Yeah, I mean, it's really just a different way of uh, rewording a lot of what's in the adjudicative guidelines without pointing to a specific violation. And, you know, uh, there's a couple examples. I mean, you could look at drugs and alcohol. You could look at criminal conduct. And if you go through these seven, uh, the, the, the uh, you know, the seven elements here that OPM uses, you would look at the seriousness and nature of the conduct, which you already talked about, um, circumstances surrounding the conduct. And we look at that in security clearance adjudications to see if there's a way that we can mitigate the concerns. Can we show that it was unique circumstances such that it would be unlikely to ever reoccur? And then you move on to recency of conduct. And in a security clearance adjudication, something like drug use, they want to know about recency and frequency. So you're going through each of these things, and um, they really do run parallel, which is why I think so many people get confused and, and will we'll use the language interchangeably from the adjudicative guidelines often. Yeah, so one thing, uh, and I know you know this uh, because we have discussions like this all the time, but uh, one of the things I get uh, questions about all the time is, you know, can somebody be found suitable for employment but then eventually not be granted a security clearance? Yeah, this happens all the time, and it, in a in a perfect world, the order would be uh, the agency gathers all of their information, they review that information to determine whether they want to continue to work towards hiring this individual, because it's usually just a conditional position at that point in time. Uh, you know, sometimes that information is gathered through the OF-306 form, sometimes it's an SF-86 form. Uh, it just depends on the position and, and what they're looking at. And sometimes it's the public trust, which a lot of people think is, is an actual security clearance, but it's different from an actual security clearance. So that's the SF-85 or 85P. Uh, so you've got a bunch of different forms at play. The agency will use the forms that they, that they think they need to do to, to, to use to gather the information that they need. And then at the end of it, they'll look at all of that information, hopefully before they begin processing the security clearance application. They'll, they'll review that information and they'll make their suitability determination at that time. And again, this is the employment decision. That's the easiest way to draw the distinction between the two. So is this somebody we want to employ? If they think that it's an individual that they want to employ based off of the information that they collect, then they'll, uh, they'll move forward and they'll release the, the applications for adjudication. Uh, you know, in most cases, the SF-86 for security clearance. That doesn't mean the individual is going to get a security clearance. That's when the the uh, actual investigation starts because there's really been no investigation yet. So the investigation is assigned and meet with the individual. Maybe there's a polygraph. Uh, maybe they talk with the individual's friend who says, yeah, we smoked marijuana together a whole bunch of times and that's not on the application. Maybe they find out that the individual was arrested and didn't disclose the arrest or there's uh, unpaid taxes, student loans that are delinquent, things of that nature that might not be disclosed on the SF-86. So the employer made the, the best decision they could with the information that they had, but then the investigator digs up a bunch of new information. Those that, that information alone could be guideline violations, but then withholding that information is a very difficult guideline violation, uh, a guideline E violation for intentionally withholding information. That's you, you know, generally that can be the most difficult one to overcome in a case like that. So there's a good chance then that that individual would not get their security clearance, but they were still found suitable. The agency still wanted to hire them, but now the agency will have to withdraw the offer because the individual can't get the security clearance that's required for the position. Yeah, and you mentioned the OF 306 too, which, you know, obviously we know, but uh, it is a significantly less invasive um, document than the SF-86. So, you know, there's obviously circumstances where somebody can be found suitable based upon the information they provide in that document, but then, you know, you go back seven years for drug use or something like that in SF-86, you know, that could trigger potentially a, a security clearance issue. Um, on top of that, you know, there's also typically a third uh, a third party, whether it be, you know, for DOD, it's DCSA CAF. It used to be DOD CAF. Obviously, they changed the name a hundred times now, but, um, you know, that actually does the adjudication, right? So even let's say the Department of Army can find you, you know, suitable for employment based upon the OF-306, uh, DCSA could say, nope, sorry, based upon the information that we have in this investigation that you mentioned, 
uh, you know, they could they could say, no, you, you, you got an issue, we're going to issue you a statement of reasons, and then you're going to have to go through that entire adjudicated process. Sure. Yeah, I mean, as you mentioned, the timeline, to, the timeline alone could result in a completely different fact pattern. You know, five years ago, you could have been using marijuana regularly and, and uh, you know, doing things at work that you're not supposed to be doing. There's a whole bunch of things that you could have been doing five, six, seven years ago that you stopped when you graduated from college or something like that, and now you're getting a form that's asking the past year, maybe you've been out of college for three years and you haven't used marijuana or Adderall is a common one or, or, or done certain things that, um, you know, might – cause an issue for a security clearance, but now you've got to list those on the S of 86, which is a longer window in the, in the 85P as well. So, um, And then foreign contacts is another one. You know, uh, S of 86 is very invasive when it comes to your uh, relationship with foreign contacts, whether you've got close and continuing um, contacts with foreign nationals. You don't have to report that on other forms. So uh, it really just depends on which forms you're uh, completing and, and at which stage in the process will determine whether you're going to get past uh, each step. Yeah, so uh, so as far as the voting determinations go, uh, Tony, um, those are typically for federal employees, right? Uh, but in some circumstances, there could be situations where a government contractor could be found unsuitable to work on, let's say, a government contract. So even though they're not working for the agency, they're not actually employed with a federal agency, they could be found unsuitable um, but, uh, you know, how that impacts their appointment, I guess, is up in the air. But um, you know, what's your experience with that as far as who this uh, the suitability determinations are usually uh, applicable to? Sure, yeah. I mean, it, uh, it happens all the time. So a suitability determination doesn't have to be for a sensitive position. But if you're, uh, if you're obtaining a security clearance, you're a contractor, and you're going to work uh, under a contract with your company, but supporting an agency or working for an agency, you'll probably have to go through that suitability determination, and um, there's a possibility that they would say, even if you hold a clearance, there's a possibility at that point that that agency might say you're unsuitable to do work in that facility. So, so a lot of people think, well, it's just a suitability. It's not going to be uh, as, as strict of a background investigation. In some cases, we've seen some <laughs> some suitability uh, some suitability reviews get pretty thorough and pretty detailed and dig up some information that maybe the individual got away with hiding in a security clearance application. So don't think that just because it's suitability, you're good and you can provide less information and, and squeak through. They will catch it. So uh, and then you know maybe later you're going to have to take a polygraph for another position or um, move forward with a security clearance application. And now you're disclosing information that you left off of. Uh, prior paperwork, you know, just to get your, your employment check, your suitability check. Um, if that happens, the investigator is probably going to uncover it, uh, call you out on the discrepancy, and accuse you of intentionally withholding that information on an application. So um, you probably won't go to jail for it or be prosecuted for it because that doesn't happen very often unless there's certain circumstances at play, but it's going to be difficult to mitigate the concern and, and continue with your clearance or continue in the position that you hold at the time. So you want to be honest. Yeah, you, you, met, you mentioned that. I mean, the guideline E is, is one of the biggest uh, and, I guess, most difficult hurdles to overcome because one of the things obviously we're looking at, whether it's a suitability or a security clearance, is, you know, your honesty, your trustworthiness, um, you know, things like that, your integrity. And if you lie in a government form, that obviously calls all of that into question, right? Agreed. Um, all right. Well, there you have it for this month's NSLA podcast. Uh, thank you, Tony, for, for being here and taking the time to speak with us today about uh, your view and experiences on the security clearance and suitability processes. Um, I, I really appreciate your time. Uh, please take a look out for more content to assist with your current and future security clearance journeys. Uh, any last words, Tony? Nope. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Thanks so much for listening.